we then went to our next realm of trouble, which was the problem of there's not enough genes. There's not enough genes in that specific realm of explaining bifurcations and you can't, there can't be a gene that specifies, okay, this is where you bifurcate if you're this particular blood vessel and a different gene for this particular bronchial and a different gene for this branch of a dendrite in a single, it can't work that way, there's not enough genes. What this introduces is the idea of there being fractal genes. Genes whose instructions are ones that are scale free. What do I mean by this? Okay, here's what a fractal gene might do. So we've got a tube, and remember this is a tube that's going to be part of a blood vessel or a dendrite or a lung or whatever. We've got a tube. And the fractal rule here is grow this tube in distance, grow it until it is five times longer than it is wide. The width, the opening, and that's the simple rule. And the rule is when it's grown five times longer, bifurcate. So what's going to happen at that point? It's just gone five times longer, and it bifurcates at that point. And what you've got is now, because this is split in two, the cross-section is going to be shorter. But you apply the same rule. Now, with the shorter cross-section, you have the same rule, grow five times the length of that cross-section until you split. And what you wind up getting is, this is one simple fractal rule that will generate the tree patterns. That the branchings get shorter and shorter, the distances between the branch points get shorter and shorter because the cross sections are getting one simple rule and you can generate a circulatory system, a pulmonary system, and a dendritic tree by giving a fractal instruction. In this case, one that is scale free that is independent of what the unit is here, and this could work within the single neuron or within an entire circulatory system. So all of that's great. That's totally hypothetical. Ooh, fractal genes. We know by now that's got to translate into a protein in some way or other. How might this actually look in a real system? So suppose... Okay, so a gene coding for a protein. This is one copy of the protein. This is another. It's another. They bind to each other in a way so that they form a tube. And they bind to each other in a way that's just pure mechanical reality of these are not inf bits of information. These are actual proteins. So it's going up in the tube there. And suppose that the forces are, as the tube goes up, it gets more and more unstable. And when the tube is high enough, it gets unstable enough that these bonds between the proteins begin to weaken and it begins to split. The splitting there is a function of the length of these. So it's split and now the next one has half the number of cell of proteins in this one and thus it's that much weaker so you only have to go a shorter distance now before it begins to split. This doesn't exist. There's no way it's like this but what you could begin to see is here's how you could turn a scale free set of instructions potentially into what it would actually look like with mortar and bricks in terms of proteins how it might actually work. Now the notion of fractal genetics, of fractal genes, and fractal instructions begins to solve another problem. And this is that space problem of how much stuff can you jam into a space. Here's the challenge here in terms of how dense things are. In the body, amazing factoid, there is no cell in your body that is more than five cells away from a blood vessel. Okay, you could see why you would want to do that, but that is not an easy thing to pull off. How do you do that with the circulatory system? An amazing other factoid to factor in with that is the circulatory system comprises less than 5% of your body mass. How can this be? You've got this, uh, you've got this system that's everywhere but it's taking up almost no space. It's within five cells of every cell out there, yet it's less than 5% of the body. And, okay, forget it, I'm not gonna put that up. But what this begins to, okay, you convinced me. So let's do this. So what you begin to do is transition to a world of fractal geometry. You've got all your Euclidean world of nice, smiley, strange things there. You've got this whole world 
of shapes that are constrained by classic Cartesian geometry and all of that. And what fractal geometry generates are objects that simply cannot exist. Here up on top, eventually, you will see the first example of this. And this is out of the Chaos book. And this is this Cantor set. What you do is you start with a line. You start with a line, and you cut out the middle third. Now for those remaining two ones, you cut out the middle third. For those remaining four, you cut out the middle third. And there it is. And you just keep doing this over and over and over again. And what do you do when you take it out to infinity? What have you generated? A set of an infinitely large number of objects, lines, that take up an infinitely small amount of space. It's not possible for that to work, yet as you go more and more that direction, you get this impossible ph phenomenon of something approaching having an infinite number of places that something appears while taking up almost an infinitely small amount of space. And what this winds up being is it's not quite a line anymore at the bottom, but it's kind of more than a dot. It's somewhere between one and two dimensions. It's a fractal. Its dimensional state is somewhere one point something or other. It is somewhere between dots and a line. And it does this impossible thing, which is it's everywhere without taking up any space. Or you could then push it to the same thing in the next dimension. And this is this Koch snowflake. And it's the same sort of rule. You start with the triangle there. And the rule is you take the middle third and you put a little triangle out of it. And then to take the middle third of that and put a little triangle out and a middle third. And you just keep doing it forever and ever and ever. And you wind up with something that is impossible, which is an object that has an infinite amount of perimeter, an infinite amount of surface area within a finite space. That's impossible. But it begins to approach this. And what do you see here? This is a way of just iterating over and over and over to jam a huge amount of surface area into a tiny space. And thus, it's somewhere the different, sort of like a line, but it's sort of like a plane by then. And it's got a fractal form somewhere between 2 and 3. It's got a fractal quality of 2 point something or other. It's an impossible object that is solving this problem of being, in another version, having surface area everywhere without taking up any space and being within a finite area. Next, finally, this Menger sponge, which is the same exact concept again. You start with the box up there, the ring, and you take out the middle third of each of those segments. And then you take out the middle third of each of those segments. And if you're doing this with what starts off as a three-dimensional cube, eventually you get something that cannot exist, which is an object that has an infinitely large amount of surface area while having no volume. That's what it produces at the extreme. And we got something here that's somewhere between two different dimensions, a fractal again. And what you see is this is how the body solves the packing problem. Because all you need to do is make the circulatory system, <laughs> not circulatory system, some version of this, some version of splitting the ends of the capillaries over and over and over, or making the lungs with their surface area for exchanging oxygen, looking something like this. And this is how you generate a system that is everywhere and taking up virtually no space. Obviously, it's not taken out to infinity. But this is how you can have a circulatory system that's five cells away from every cell in the body, yet takes up less than 5% of the body. This is a fractal solution. All you do here to generate these is taking some of these qualities over and over and over and over. And you can begin to produce absolutely bizarre, impossible things in terms of surface area and perimeter and volume and all of that. This is how you can use a fractal system to solve the packing problem. Of course, as soon as you're coming up with the notion of something like fractal genes, you, of course, have to consider the possibility of there being fractal mutations. What would a fractal mutation look like? And again, most people, most geneticists and molecular people do not think about this in these terms. But there are people who do, who actually talk about things like fractal gene mutations. What would it look like? Suppose you've got a mutation. 
and it produces a protein that's slightly different and as a result it's got bonds here that are slightly weaker between different proteins. So on a mechanical level, what have we just defined? This is a tube that's going to grow of these proteins where it's a shorter distance before it begins to split because these bonds between them are not as strong. There's a mutation now where instead of growing five times the cross section, maybe you're growing 4.9 times the cross section. And thanks to that mutation, the entire branching system is going to be compacted a bit. It's not going to reach the target cells. And these would be catastrophic mutations where the pulmonary system doesn't develop, the circulatory system doesn't develop. And what you would see in those cases is the mutation is something that has consequences that are scale free. Another hint when you see some fractal gene mutations are a small number of diseases that they're about spatial relationships in the body. For example, there's a disease called Kalman syndrome where you get stuff that's wrong with midline structures in the body. Something is wrong with the septum between the noses, the nostrils. Something is wrong in the hypothalamus. Something is wrong in the septum of the heart. This is not three different mutations. This is some sort of fractal mutation messing up how that embryo did symmetry how the embryo does midline structures. So you begin to see ways here in which you can solve this and within biological metaphor where you could begin to get solutions for these problems that are also mutations that can put you up the creek.